Right. First of all, I would like to welcome everybody to today's meeting. It, it's fantastic to see um, so many people here and um, we've invited a number of people to be part of the, the panel today. So just to to frame this briefly, what, what's going to happen. So I will just say a few words and then we will have the sort of main discussion uh, with the panel and then towards the end, Olga will just um, uh, say a few words as well. That will be the, the sort of more uh, general um, uh, summary of the meeting today. Um, and I just wanted to sort of take the opportunity to, um, yeah, first of all, welcome you to today's meeting and just to remind ourselves, so basically SDC Net, so today is the last uh, meeting of that formal network, shall I say, so the Server Data Collection Network in this form. It was obviously funded by ESRC, as you know, and was run under the uh, NCM grant and everything is on our website under the NCM website. So you can have a look at that. I've put these things here in the slides and everything will be available, obviously, from that from that website. And um, we also when uh, more reports uh, from this group or uh, sort of online resources become available, then we will make them um, available on that website. Over the next couple of months, there will be uh, more coming up uh, there. Um, maybe that's all I wanted to say. So we had obviously just briefly reviewing several meetings on various key topics. In fact, for example, innovations in survey methods or survey data collection methods, the future of face to face. We've discussed the role of interviewers and so on. Um, and yeah, today's final meeting is looking at the sort of commissioner side. Um, we do. We are obviously very keen to continue um, with this type of uh, meeting or this type of exchange. And in fact, um, uh, we are in the process of sorting out and, and Olga will say a few more things at the very end um, of this meeting. Um, the uh, funding from the ESRC to continue with part of this work as part of a new um, funded collaboration. It's called the Survey Data Collection Methods Collaboration and a number of us will be a part of this and there will be opportunities to join in the future as well but but Olga will pick that up um, at the end so while this is the final meeting under this particular grant um, we very much hope that we can um, continue with a very similar setup in the future and today's meeting is basically uh, yeah looking at various decisions making in particular focusing on the commissioner side um, decision making because of server, yeah, survey commissioning in a multi-source, multi-mode world, effectively. And I would like to hand to um, Jerry Nicolas, who will lead us uh, through the panel discussion. So I'm Jerry Nicolas. I'm director of methods at Natsen, and it's my pleasure to chair and moderate the panel discussion today. Um, Gabby has already mentioned um, that uh, uh, the, today's event is focusing on the perspective of those who commission surveys and how they decide on the most appropriate methods and data sources to meet their information needs. Uh, we're fortunate to have five very experienced commissioners and leads, at least I hope it's going to be five of you, um, because one of them hasn't quite joined us yet. Olga and Gabby, if one of you could let me know when he has joined, because then I will stop and welcome him and introduce him as well. Um, I'm very grateful for you giving up your valuable time to, to come and join us today. But before I introduce the panel members, I'm, I'd like to explain the format of the event. So first of all, each panel member will have about five minutes to tell us a bit about the surveys that they commission or lead on and how they use the survey data. I'll then ask them a series of questions on the pros and cons of the survey method for their information needs, how they make decisions on the choice of survey mode, the use of new technologies and the use of other data sources, and also what they as survey commissioners need from us survey providers and academic researchers to help them make better informed decisions on survey commissioning and research design. Now that should bring us to about 2.30, possibly earlier, depending on how much we have to say. And then we will still have up to 30 minutes for a discussion with you, the audience. You're invited to put your questions or comments in the chat, which Olga will be monitoring and collating. Um, there'll also be an opportunity to raise your hand during the general discussion, so not during the panel discussion, but later on if you want to actually ask your um, questions in person. So let's introduce the panel members. First of all, Mike Daly. Um, Mike works in the Central Analysis and Science Strategy Unit in the Department for Work and Pensions. He works on a range of issues, mostly centred around external engagement with academia, like the people here, um, uh, and also with data linkage and evaluation. 
We also have with us Michael Dale, who's Head of Longitudinal Studies in the Central Research Division at the Department for Education. Um, we're still waiting to see whether Alistair McAlpine will join us. Um, Ali is the new Chief Statistician of the Scottish Government. Um, his role is wide ranging and includes overseeing the quality and management of its household surveys. Martina Portanti is an Assistant Deputy Director in the Social Survey Delivery Division at the ONS. Martina is responsible for the delivery and development of the Household Finance Survey portfolio at ONS. And then finally, Andrew Spears. Andrew is the Strategic Lead for Research and Analysis at Sport England. So welcome and thank you all for joining us. So at this point, I'm going to try and hand over to you so you can tell us a little bit about the survey research that you are responsible for. for. So perhaps I could start with you, Mike Daly. Just a, a few th introductory thoughts about the sort of um, interest DWP has in surveys. I think the first thing to say is a lot of the uh, survey evidence we get, um, we don't commission ourselves directly. So we make a huge amount of use of surveys such as Understanding Society and the Birth Cohort Study, English Longitudinal Study of Aging and so forth and so on. Um, some of those we use more than others. Um, some of them we actually co-fund to, uh, to some extent. Um, so I'm not going to talk about those because although we're desperately interested in the way that those surveys are set up and run, um, the the choices about methods are essentially for uh, for the people in charge of those surveys, and it will be um, completely inappropriate for me to to start talking about them. We also have a lot of um, relatively um, one off, I think we could call them one off surveys that we run. So. Um, I was talking to colleagues, in fact, just before this about some surveys we're running as part of the evaluations we are doing of various employment programmes. Um, and I can say a bit more in, in a minute about how we make choices about um, those surveys. In terms of regular large scale surveys, we have essentially two um, that we uh, that we run. The biggest of those by a distance is the Family Resources Survey, which of course Martina will know all about. Um, it's not that uh, that far removed from, from your interests. Um, and that's a, a survey of around 20,000 households conducted face to face um, with field work running throughout the year. And that's been uh, that's been running for over 30 years now. Um, had my colleague Joanna Littlechild been able to um, be here, she could have said much more about that. But in fact, she is um, busily preparing for the publication tomorrow of the latest results. So if anybody's interested in the FRS, um, then uh, you need to get on the Internet at 9.30 tomorrow morning um and you'll see some lots of exciting stuff there the other survey which we run regularly which is very very different is um our internal customer satisfaction and experience survey um which is uh carried out um field work is quarterly um around 12,000 respondents uh per uh, per year and that is one where we are moving from face to face uh, data collection more towards um, online uh, data collection. I just have to say something about how we choose our approaches. Um, and it is very much dependent on the um, on the context. So when you think about something like the Family Resources Survey, this is um, something which uh, provides data which not only um, is a source for published national statistics, um, including important things like our uh, like estimates of how many people are below the poverty line, um, but it also forms the base data for the micro simulation model we have for all DWP policies. 
um, and a range of other uses. So the uh, the onus on us to get this um, as right as we possibly can and our willingness to invest um, heavily in getting the right results is huge. Um, as also is the pressure to make sure we don't do anything which upsets the consistency of data collected over time. And one of the uh, one of the things that we have to accept with our methodology for the FRS is that um, there is a significant time lag in it. So the um, the results um, published tomorrow relate to the financial year 21-22. So there's there's quite a time lag in that. Another important consideration in our design of that is we collect an enormous amount of data. Um, so the questionnaire is very long. Um, some of the questions are quite involved. Uh, we try to collect data from everybody in a household. So all those things tend to point us towards face-to-face um, -face data collection, as we've done for, for many years. The um, customer experience survey is almost at the other end of the spectrum, where although we there is still a premium on getting good data out of it, the, uh, the importance of getting results as quickly as possible and having a survey which is as agile as possible to respond to changing um, policy and operational needs is huge. And the questions we ask are relatively straightforward and we ask them of individuals rather than households. So that points us in a different direction um, for the survey methodology. And then all the other one-off surveys which we do, um, it's the same the same sort of criteria we uh, we consider. Um, how how important is the survey? How quickly do we need the results? How involved is the data collection? Um, what sort of data are we collecting? And we make decisions um, as appropriate as we see appropriate in each case. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Andrew Spears. I lead the research and analysis team at Sport England. And for those of you perhaps not familiar with Sporting, we're an arm's length body of the Department for Culture, Media and Sport. And our responsibility, as the name suggests, is to promote community sport and physical activity amongst the population of England. So core to our mission as an organisation is about increasing levels of activity amongst people, reducing levels of inactivity, I guess the flip side of that. And within that, tackling the inequalities that we observe in, in, that, in that, 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 that sort of form of engagement. So that might be by age, gender, socioeconomic status, disability, cultural diversity and, and, and other characteristics. Um, for a relatively small arm's length body, um, I think it's probably fair to say we've made quite a major and long standing commitment to sort of population level measurement survey. So we can go right back to 2005-06 where we launched our active people survey, which was a, a landline telephone survey for adults, people aged 16 and over. Uh, with the exception of uh, one year's worth of gap in 2006-07, we ran that for 10 annual waves. But then in 2015-16, we launched our current and uh, um, adult uh, participation survey called the Active Lives Survey, which is a mixed mode survey um, where we encourage people to complete um, online, so push the web survey. That is, again, an adult survey of people aged 16 years and over, and it is now in its eighth, eighth annual wave of data collection. In 2017-18, we launched alongside that adult survey, um, our very imaginatively named Active Lives Child Survey, which covers children and young people in school years one to 11. Um, and that survey is a, an online survey uh, where we recruit the young people through a sample of schools, and within each school, we then randomly select year groups. And then with each year group, we randomly select a mixed ability class to collect the data from. All of our surveys uh, perform broadly the same purpose for the organisations. So they're about measuring the levels, patterns and trends of engagement in sport and physical activity. And probably two of the sort of uh, foundational, or most important uh, uh, criteria that we've had when we've been thinking about uh, how we've designed and set up those surveys 
is the need to be able to measure at a local authority level across England. So be able to produce a defensible and robust estimate for every local authority in the country. And also to be able to measure activity levels across a range of different types of sports and activities, some of which will be quite low prevalence. So that could be everything from walking and cycling, fitness activities, uh, dance, uh, but even um, and what might regard as more traditional sports like football, tennis, cricket, etc. So those two requirements, the ability to look at quite a local level and also be able to measure some quite low prevalence activities, has dictated to some extent the sort of scale of the data collection that we, we do. So for the adult survey, typically we get about 175,000 responses each year. And for the child survey, it's a bit smaller, but we still achieve uh, about 100,000 responses um, each year. Um, and again, we'll come back to this, I'm sure, over the course of the session, but that, that requirement has, I guess, dictated some of the choices we've made around the mode of data collection we do. Um, alongside our specific needs around understanding physical activity and patterns of behaviour, we also collect some data on behalf of some key partners. So the Office of Health Improvement um, uh, and, and Disparities, where we collect some additional physical activity data around gardening, which they add to the, uh, the rest of the physical activity information that we collect. We also ask questions around height and weight on their behalf, which enables them to calculate excess weight in the population and also consumption of fruit and vegetables. So how many people are meeting the five a day target? So some broader public health measures there, which are very relevant to our mission as an organisation as well. Then we also do some work with the Department for Transport, who use some of the walking and cycling data that's collected to provide local walking and cycling statistics. There are a few other things the survey covers as well, which are of, of more direct relevance to Sports England. So those people that volunteer to support for sport and physical activity, people's attitudes towards sport and physical activity, the extent to which they enjoy it, how comfortable and capable they feel playing sports, um, and also uh, some information around what we describe as outcomes, but essentially things that um, uh, are sort of positive uh, uh, outcomes, which we know are associated with physical activity. And it's interesting to sort of see the correlations there. Um, all of the data collection we do, um, I guess, starts with a, a probability probability sampling approach, and I think that's very important to us. It's all cross-sectional, and at the moment, all of it is self-reported data that comes forward from the respondents. And I guess in common with most of the other sort of commissioners who will be on this call, that data then is really important to us in terms of guiding our decision making around a range of things. So it helps us understand uh, the populations of most need, the places and geographies that most need our help and support, it helps us understand overall trends um, in activity um, and how things are going there, but also how patterns and preferences are changing between activities, which again is really helpful in guiding our sort of policy and investment decisions. So hopefully that gives a, a reasonable overview of, of, of uh, um, yeah, Sports England and our sort of background and history in terms of data collection. So I'm from DfE uh, and I'm primarily responsible for longitudinal surveys, but I'll try and talk a bit more generally about the surveys that we commission and um, so I've got quite a long list um, so our longitudinal studies primarily focus on children and young people's outcomes so we're finishing off LSYP2 which was a, a, a cohort of adolescents passing into the um, labour markets and um, we're currently running a big program called EOPS which is uh, five four five year studies looking at um, the progress and development of uh, children and young people across various different stages of education from early years through to post-16. Um, and we've also got another longitudinal study of care leavers. So um, each of those are big probability sample longitudinal studies that collect a lot of data that really enhances the administrative records that we've got in relation to service use and that sort of thing. Um, and yeah, they're, they're all very much focused on children and young people and their, their outcomes and sort of feed into strategy level evidence bases and decisions and that sort of thing. So that's children and young people, if you like, in the longitudinal part. Um, the other part of the longitudinal work that we do is in relation to practitioners, uh, where we, we want to understand their experience of their job and retention and quality and all those sorts of things. 
Um, we have one on teachers, um, which is ongoing, and we also have one uh, on the cohort of social workers, which is just wrapping up. Um, it's been uh, extremely uh, valuable, and perhaps we're looking to do something similar with that or extend that cohort somehow. So those are the longitudinal studies. Um, then we've got uh, more sort of topical omnibus stu studies uh, where we're looking for kind of quick perception and attitudinal data to help inform uh, rapidly evolving policy and thinking. And so uh, we've got one of young people, one of people's and parents, one of school teachers and leaders, and I think there's one in the post-16 space as well. But as the omnibus name suggests, that's quite sort of uh, an eclectic bunch of questions that I, th I think it's better to run quarterly those surveys. A uh, very good quick turnaround um, information that perhaps isn't quite so robust, but nonetheless is better than having no evidence whatsoever. And then we've got very policy specific projects like the childcare surveys, and there's one on skills and qualifications, and we you know, also have surveys that service evaluations, etc. And you know, these are these are kind of studies that are narrow in their scope but have a great deal of depth in relation to a specific population of interest specific um, policy um, or it might be that uh, they regularly collect trends uh, that are most pertinent to a, a particular policy um, so that isn't a complete list but it's an example of some of the types of uh, policy relevant surveys for commission then we've got involvement in, inter in international studies and um, so there's Isles of Pisa, which we use for benchmarking. Ministers do like a good international comparison, they get a lot of press. And um, we're also involved as co funders the Millennium Cohort Study um, and in some sort of advisory capacity in relation to other ESRC funded um, uh, longitudinal studies, um, which are often run by UCL. Um, and then on the question of what, why do we collect all this data, what's the point, why are we spending millions and millions of pounds on, on all this stuff? Um, essentially, it's to improve, help improve policy or come up with new policies or ask the Treasury for sustained money or more, more money. Um, in the, those are very crude terms, obviously, but I think a lot of what we do, that's what it boils down to. Um, I could be a little bit more specific if, uh, if you'll allow me the time. Um, so in terms of I can use LSYP2 as a case study. So in terms of targeting policy, uh, that's recently helped us profile pupils with different levels of and reasons for an authorised absence, which has been a big issue, particularly after the pan pandemic. Um, in terms of understanding outcomes, so we've been able to brief number 10 recently on how um, those taking apprenticeship post-16 routes uh, seem to bear well, both in terms of material and, 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 and well-being outcomes. Um, raising awareness of issues is another function. Um, so we've been able to enable a minister to write to um, the sector to encourage them to uh, work against the gendered issues in, in STEM. Um, so showing that girls are uh, at, at science and maths when everyone's taking the same exams, they do just as well, if not better than boys. But after that, they're less interested, less likely to take this STEM job and uh, and, and and go down that path. And um, so, yeah, the minister wrote uh, something to the national press and wrote directly to providers as well, encouraging them to tackle that prejudice and how to do it. There's lots of things around government, like government reviews and inquiries and that sort of thing. And that's why PT has been used a lot for that sort of thing. So um, models. Uh, yeah, so we had models of um, how ethnicity uh, is predictive of P stage four, for example, um, and that fed into um, Commission on Race and Ethnic Dis Disparities, um, which I think was run, run by the Cabinet Office. There's other things like emerging issues where it's just handy to have a, a really rich data set on something that's suddenly become topical. So, um, and this, you know, there's lots of studies that fed into this, but when the when the pandemic struck, we were able to look in a longitudinal sense at how it was impacting the psychological health of a particular cohort of young people uh, and, and, and the differential impact within that as well, who was uh, um, suffering the worst. Uh, and then also just the big sort of strategic questions that sometimes require very rich data to understand. So an example here is better understanding, uh, well, uh, understanding why 
disadvantaged pupils in London do better compared with their peers. Um, so, yeah, with a multi-level model, bringing in the admin data and all the survey data we have, we were able to pretty much explain that, um, which is helpful, uh, albeit um, not necessarily the answer ministers wanted because they wanted to hear it was a, it was a policy, um, a strong policy driver um, behind London's advantage, if you like, it didn't turn out to be the case. Um, so yeah, that's me. Thanks for giving me some time and happy to take questions uh, later on. Great. So, so there was one question on the chat specifically to Michael about the care leavers study. I just wondered if, if it was Leo you were talking about or something different. I'm the care leavers analyst lead for DWP and wasn't aware of anything other than Leo. Uh, no, so this is a, a dedicated longitudinal study following um, a particular group of care leavers. I think it might have been those that were on a kinship uh, order arrangement. I'm not sure the exact terminology, not my remit. Um, but um, if you, yeah, if you drop me an email, I can connect you with the project lead. Hi, uh, my name is Martina Portanti, and uh, as Jerry mentioned, I had uh, the area at ONS that looks, uh, looks after all our household finances statistics uh, uh, surveys. So. Basically, when I talk about household finances surveys, uh, um, I'm talking about our living cost and food survey, our wealth and assets survey, and uh, um, the survey on living conditions. So obviously, as, as people on the call will know, ONS does carry out a lot of surveys. <laughs> um, quite large, um, label for survey, cram survey during the pandemic. Uh, um, we're still running actually the COVID infection survey. So, so there are probably more surveys that I can really mention in this uh, five minutes call, So, which is why I'm, I'm going to concentrate very much on the three that I look after in my area. So um, I think I'm a bit in a fortunate position uh, in my role um, that we sort of sit a little bit in between uh, what is a more traditional commissioning role and a data collection role. So clearly ONS doesn't have the sort of policy um, aspect, so we don't contribute directly to policy. We collect a lot of data that is used by a lot of government departments uh, um, to um, inform their policies uh, and uh, uh, we also collect a lot of data ourselves so, so we can commission design uh, and carry out the collection all in the same place um, which creates some interesting tension sometimes between the different hats uh, that one is wearing uh, um, but essentially the, the three surveys uh, that i look after they are quite um, large very expensive um, complicated service <laughs> i will summarize them so a little bit similar to what Mike uh, explained in terms of uh, um, the family resource survey. They are all surveys that collect sort of financial information from households. So the living cost and food survey is around 5,000 households per year and uh, collects a lot of very detailed uh, expenditure information on what um, UK households buy. Um, mostly face-to-face, -face, uh, has also got a um, diary where we ask people for two weeks uh, to absolutely record everything they spend their money on. So that is quite burdensome for uh, not only for the respondents, but only also for us uh, to pick up and process uh, in-house. Um, we then have uh, the surreal living condition, um, which is something that um, ONS has been carrying out uh, to feed into Eurostat statistics, um, and we're still carrying out now, even after Brexit. Uh, and this is a longitudinal survey of households uh, where we collect a lot of detailed information about income uh, and poverty. And the longitudinal element basically allows uh, to um, assess uh, whether people uh, uh, stay in poverty. So um, it, it fits into statistics of uh, persistent poverty, which is something that is uh, very unique to the SRC actually, um, given its uh, longitudinal nature. And the third survey is the wealth uh, and asset survey. Um, and that and this is again is quite a unique survey, actually, also internationally, because we collect uh, quite a lot of detailed information on what people own, their assets, their pension, uh, in order to produce a figure of um, basically um, overall wealth for uh, Great Britain. So this one is not carried out in Northern Ireland. Um, the Western Assess Survey is also a longitudinal survey. Um, 
I think we are getting, we are currently collecting this eighth uh, round of data. So it's been running for around 16 years. Uh, but some of the other surveys have a much longer history. Um, I mean, ONS has been collecting expenditure data since 1957 uh, in some sort of form or another. So I, I think I, I, I resonate a lot with what Mike mentioned before about the need of consistency over time, which sometimes creates issues when we try to modernize uh, data collection. Um, the other two things specifically that I find with these surveys is, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, is the complexity of the topic. Uh, so at the moment, we are looking at options to redesign these surveys. We are carrying out a, a large project uh, um, to redesign the surveys. Uh, it's called also Finance Statistics Transformation. Some of the people on the call might have seen our recent consultation that closed. But essentially, from a survey point of view, the biggest challenge we have is that our users want very rich information, uh, a lot of variable for the same households. Uh, and that is very challenging uh, to move away from a more traditional interviewer-led role um, because it just doesn't fit uh, in a 20 minutes online uh, interview. Um, the other aspect as well that is quite challenging is, um, is definitely the longitudinal aspect. Uh, so it's good to know that uh, the other Michael here you know, <laughs> is also aware of some of these challenges with longitudinal data. It's just very difficult. It's all the engagement in between waves and making sure that people come back and they don't get bored. And I think it's fair to say that some of the topics clearly on household finances are not exactly the most exciting. <laughs> So, so there are all these sort of challenges. Uh, um, so we are looking at options to try to modernize. And, and I, I think that there is a lot of pressure to try to make these surveys less expensive, uh, which is um, which probably something that most commissioners feel a little bit the pinch uh, at the moment in the current uh, financial climate. So I'll just give you a bit of the, the context of the Scottish surveys that we've got running. Um, so there's three large uh, household surveys that were run in the Scottish Government. So they're the, the Scottish House Survey, the Scottish, uh, Sc sorry, the Scottish Health Survey, the Scottish Household Survey, uh, which also includes the Scottish House Conditions Survey, and then the Scottish Crime and Justice Survey. And, and those are essential sources of data and, and they provide detailed information on, on all the kind of topics of housing, fuel poverty, energy efficiency, transport, culture, uh, volunteering, childcare, uh, lots, crime and justice as well. Uh, quite importantly as well is also the quality characteristics. I'll come back to that in a second. But I mean, data from each of these surveys is feeding into national statistics publications and, and our national performance indicators as well uh, through the national performance framework, which is our wellbeing measures in Scotland. Um, prior to COVID-19, um, we were doing all these household surveys face to face uh, and interviews were with around 20,000 households every year, um, usually involving visiting between four and 6,000 uh, households in a, a four to six week period. Um, that's obviously changed a little bit, but um, what's important actually with those three surveys, we combine them together is we've also got the, the Scottish surveys core questions in there which allows us, and, and those are the common questions that we ask across all three of the surveys, which gives us a bit more um, breadth um, and allows us to give a bit more detailed analysis at local authority level and for small population groups, which is why it's important uh, to identify equality characteristics out of the core questions as well. I'll just uh, briefly run in, and I know you're probably trying to catch up with time, Jerry, so I'll not go into too much detail, but I'll just highlight a few other big surveys um, that we've got. So we've got Growing Up in Scotland, um, which is the longitudinal study, and it's, it's a fantastic uh, piece of work um, running since 2005 and 6. Um, children were 10 months old at that stage, um, so Gus has followed them, and it's the best quality available data source that we really have on children and young people of that age group, and it's used quite extensively uh, not just at a national and local level, but also at a voluntary sector level as well. And policymakers are able to use that. It's available for academics, practitioners, researchers. But the longitudinal nature of that study really allows us um, to do some in-depth analysis of the impact of early life experiences. And the, and since we've gone through the, 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 the first, second and non-third cohorts, later outcomes as well. 
uh, and that that current co that current first cohort are now in the cusp of adulthood, and that's quite important. Um, I was also in a, a, a discussion yesterday with a, an aptly named Haggis, uh, which is healthy aging in Scotland, and um, that's a, a piece of work that's been uh, done by D David Bell at Stirling University, and we're looking at that as well because I think we're we're also now starting to track those parents who are now starting to move into older age. Um, so I think th with all of these surveys together, it's given us a real span of lived experience in Scotland, outcomes and how that affects, uh, how it affects those outcomes. Um, I'll mention a couple of other ones. Well, I'll mention one more, Jerry, and then I'll hand back to you one. And I'll ha mention this one because it's close to my heart because it used to be in my, the area uh, before it became chief statistician. I worked in agriculture, but um, we have the Scottish Farm Business Survey as well. And that's really uh, is an authoritative uh, financial analysis of farming in Scotland and farm businesses in Scotland. And it's really important to be able to es estimate Scottish farm business income, which everybody assumes Farmers are wealthy and, and, and rich, uh, which is, it couldn't be further from the truth. Um, and it really does help us to start to look at how do we replace common agricultural policy? What support needs to be done uh, to help support farmers uh, become uh, more environmentally friendly? Not that they already aren't, they are, but how can we help support them as can they support objectives to carbon ca uh, capture carbon on farms and uh, as well as reducing the carbon outputs? I'll stop at that point. I could go on, but Jerry, I think you want to move on uh, to, to further <laughs> Thank questions. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure we'll have lots more questions for you as we go along, so uh, that's fine. But thank you all very much for that overview. I mean, one of the themes that seem to be popping up again and again in what you were all saying and is something that we're going to try and unpick in the, in the next, uh, what is it? Uh, 45 minutes <laughs> is 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 on the one hand this need for very rich very precise accurate data on very complex issues the need for consistent time series which seems to be pushing people towards the face-to-face -to -face, uh, big surveys versus also the need for uh, more timely surveys that can react to to um, emerging issues um, and and obviously that those um, how the data are being used how what, what the reason is is affecting how you then decide on on the on the survey design so those are things we will be looking at in a little bit more detail in a bit um, but first I thought we would just step back a bit and just think okay we've seen especially during the pandemic that the survey method has has, has been great you know it's, it's, it's a lot of information that was needed at a time and it could be quite timely and agile possibly at the expense of, 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 of some level of accuracy but that's something we can discuss but I just wanted to get your views really Really about what the strengths and the weaknesses of the survey method are for meeting your needs, because of course it can do quite a bit, as you've already explained, but are there also limitations to what it can do? Um, so maybe I'll start this time with Michael. Um, it's a big question. Uh, so just some top of the head reflections. Uh, for our cohort studies that we've been setting up recently, um, looking uh, at the longitudinal progress of children and young people over the five course period, be it through early years, primary school, secondary school, post 16. We, um, despite sort of all the troubles and the pandemic and industry related problems, we decided to stick with uh, wave one being face to face. Um, there's a couple of reasons that um, we decided to do that. First, we wanted to build up um, a rapport with participants because we're going to be speaking to them again and again and having someone in your living room uh, having a cup of tea with a laptop is a good way of uh, of, of getting engagement with participants. Um, the other thing is wave one that's when you're going to have the most people in your study because you get attrition thereafter so having that as a substantive uh, data gathering exercise is, is important. And also there are just some types of data that you can only collect um, when there's some a level of supervision or you know, presence uh, uh, in terms of a field worker. And so in uh, a number of our studies, we're doing direct assessments of a child or a parent um, that yeah, can't just be administered via remote modes. And um, so yeah, it's kind of a bunch of things acting cumulatively to uh, suggest that 
face to face is important in that context for wave one. There's going to be um, in subsequent ways for each of the studies, there will be um, online um, on, online uh, modes in operation, but and, and they will absolutely fit the bill. Um, but we will be going back to face to face modes later to for the exact same reason as, the, as those that I mentioned before. So um, so yeah, in, in, in that context, in the EOPS context, at least uh, face to face still is uh, indispensable and worth the considerable cost. Is that, a, is that a helpful thing to have said? Does that kick us off? <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I'm just also wondering whether there are any, as, as are there any particular data requirements that you find um, currently that are particularly challenging to meet if you're using a survey? So irrespective of what Mo, but just the survey method itself, what can it deliver, but what does it fail to deliver? Is there anything it fails to deliver? Um, so again, just going back to the direct assessment point, that is a, a super useful uh, way of getting uh, of generating evidence in as much as um, you can use a validated objective instrument to get a good read, scientific read, if you like, on, for example, a child's cognitive development, mm -hmm. as opposed to just relying on their attainment records from school, which uh, aren't necessarily a good reflection of that child's cognitive ability, because there's all sorts of factors influencing whether or not children do well at school. Um, so the survey method is predicated on a sample. Uh, we all know that. Uh, and that's where uh, it starts to fall down sometimes because the administrative data sets that are available in a lot of departments are pretty much a census. Uh, and you can do detailed subgroup and intersectionality analysis that just isn't available in um, survey data sets um, because you know the, the surveys aren't sufficiently powered to be broken down to lots of cuts to the point where you can find levels of specificity or at least the confidence intervals become um, unhelpful. Um, so in that sense the surveys will always be um, competing against uh, economists and statisticians in the department who are looking at these giant data sets um, from administrative records which are often linked and can be studied in the longitudinal sense as well. Um, I suppose the other thing to say is well about, uh, I was interested to hear colleagues' thoughts, but surveys are typically thought of uh, as a way of getting perceptions and attitudes and opinions and intentions, all of which broadly fall under sort of the kind of the, the soft evidence uh, rubric, if you like. People's intentions aren't often, oh well, aren't always followed through, and people's attitudes and opinions in a survey context aren't necessarily how they operate in real life, etc. So I think that's, uh, you know, there's some potential limitations there too. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Thank you. I think I might hand over maybe to either Mike or maybe Martina, because of course your surveys collect a lot of factual information as well. So why aren't you using your administrative records and all the other data? Um, why do you need surveys? Should I have a go at that first? Um, so certainly there, there are limita limitations of, um, of surveys. So maybe I go the other direction and talk about limitations of administrative data. Um, so it's certainly true, and it's one of the reasons why we are continuing to develop the potential for linking administrative data to the survey data in the Family Resources Survey. Um, one of the difficulties is that the, uh, the administrative data can tell us uh, a huge amount about exactly which benefits people are receiving and how much they're getting, and can use that on a very um, on a very frequent basis. But they tell us virtually nothing about the people who are receiving the benefits. So if we want to know even something fairly basic, actually, with our administrative data, like um, the breakdown between people from dif different um, ethnic groups, for example, or people's family circumstances, what socioeconomic group they come from, None of that's in the administrative data. So um, if you're using a single source, then you, there is a choice sometimes between whether you want a data set which is uh, uh, 
very large, very accurate, it's got a huge sample size, but is actually very thin when, look, when looking at an individual or something which is incredibly rich on an individual basis, but has tiny samples, comparatively tiny sample size. So we are doing more work to um, combine the sources, but it's um, for various reasons that's, um, that can be somewhat slow going. Um, the other thing that uh, is worth bringing out, and I think this is something Sir Ian Diamond has pointed out a few times in um, when I've heard him talk, is that um, sometimes surveys are actually rather more nimble than administrative data. And you think particularly at the speed with which ONS set up the COVID infection survey um, and all the other survey work was done. So, for instance, the um, COVID supplementary surveys were introduced by Understanding Society in the birth cohort studies much, much more quickly than you can adapt administrative records to produce um, similar information. So I think the the assumption that um, administrators is always more timely um, is sometimes a, a bit of a um, a bit of a sloppy one. Um, you, you need to look at the need to look at the limitations. I think you also need to um, need to bear in mind that there are errors in administrative data as well. Um, and both in the there's both measurement error because there are um, administrative systems not perfect. Um, and there are coverage errors that not everybody's included in administrative data. Um, and sometimes I think that the. The kind of errors that we get in surveys are better understood. We, um, we're used to dealing with them and uh, taking them into account in analysis, whereas with the administrative data there is um, I think particularly of your your comment, Mike, about um, people loving to get their hands on on those huge data sets. There is sometimes just an assumption that it's all perfect, and you don't have to worry about where it comes from, um, and that's that just ain't ain't true. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I'm just going to check before I move on. Just can I just check if anyone else wants to add anything to that about the strengths and oh, limitations? Uh, Sorry, Ali. I, th I, th I think the one thing I would say is that I agree with what Mike and, and Michael have said, actually, and I think um, I don't I don't think it's, it's either or. Um, I think there are advantages to both administrative data and surveys, and there's obviously differences in which way we can do it. I think there's a real value in face to face interviewing. Um, and I've l recently been out with a field force officer and, and, and actually seen how that and, and why that adds value. And you, you just have to sit in one of these interviews and you, you get it. And I think there's a lot of value from administrative data. The, 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 for me, the crux of it is we can bring both things together and bring all that rich data. Then we can bring every bit of value out of it. And as somebody who is, you know, commissioning service, what I'm looking for is how much value can I get out of that amount of money that we have spent either on administrative data or on survey data. So by bringing those things together, we, we get every ounce of, of value from from all of the data that we've collected. Right. OK, thank you. I'm going to. Um, oh, sorry, uh, Martina. Sorry, there was just one point I wanted to add. I mean, I think something else we need to be a little bit careful with admin data is um, there might be some barriers in terms of being able to share it, uh, particularly micro data level. Uh, um, at the moment, some of the data sharing agreements we got in place actually they don't really allow us uh, to make that data available to the wider community. So I think it's something else that we just need to be a little bit careful. There is a lot of value. I think there is a lot of value in admin data, particularly for uh, small area estimates, uh, which is where we really struggle with the surveys. Uh, but, but there are some also some, some drawbacks. Yeah. Yeah, great. OK, thank you. I'm going to move on now to think about modes of data collection. We've really started thinking about that and talking about that. Um, but for yeah, for many decades, face to face data collection has been the primary data collection mode for most high quality surveys. And I say most because, of course, the active people survey, which was the precursor of the active live survey, was a telephone survey. 
Um, and I would like to explore that reason with Andrea in a, min in a minute. But first, um, I'd like to ask why has face-to-face -face data collection been the mode of choice for most high quality surveys in the UK? And of course, a lot of you have already mentioned the bit about the richness of the data, under being able to understand what the data is about. Um, so yeah, why, why have we stuck to the face-to-face -face for so long? Um, maybe I could ask Ali first. I, th I, th I think there is a, a temptation to say, well, it's because it's the way that we've always done things. And a lot of the things that I'm trying to change within Scottish government is the way statistics is done is to, to look at reviewing those things. And, and I'll come back to that point where I, I walked around Edinburgh uh, with an interviewer and just seeing the value that that person was getting in this is the understanding of what they they are trying to achieve and how they can tease that information out when it's not the person who's been interviewed doesn't maybe understand the question if you present that in an online form or if you ask that over the telephone you're not getting those nuances of you know the the, the kind of suggestive uh, facial expressions or things like that and I think those are the the, the parts that face-to-face -face interviews um, that absolutely trump everything um, but I think we've had a, a big experiment haven't we we've had COVID-19 we've had to move away from face-to-face -face and look at uh, telephone interviews and if I, if I look at telephone surveys we know that we're getting lower response rates mm -hmm. we know that it's more difficult to achieve satisf satisfactory sample sizes we know that it's increasing the bias in the data and that we know that it means that we're getting less accurate less representative uh, analysis for in, in, in a, 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 an unclear picture of Scotland's population as a whole. So I, what I don't think is that we can carry on doing just as we have done in the past and just use face to face. I think there has to be maybe a multi mode system where we think about it and, and both. Um, but when you, I, I mentioned earlier on, I'll just leave in this point. I mentioned earlier on the crime and justice survey. And that can be touching on really sensitive issues like sexual victimisation, partner abuse. Those are thorny issues. You can't do that justice without putting somebody in there to ask those questions sensitively. Okay, thank you. I am going to bring Andrew in at this point, though, because, of course, when face-to-face -face was the primary data collection mode, you didn't choose face-to-face -face for the active people survey. I know a little bit about the background for that, but I'd, I'd like you to share that with the rest of us. Given what, what Ali's just been saying about some of the problems with telephone, you decided to, back then to opt for the telephone method rather than face-to-face -face interview. Can you explain something about the, the trade-offs that you were making or the decision-making? Yeah, and I, and I think you're right, Jerry, to describe it as a trade-off. Um, I think I mean, fundamentally uh, we had this uh, central requirement that we wanted to be be able to provide local authority level estimates and we had a finite budget that we could justify spending on on the study that we had uh, when we looked at uh, the various sort of um, uh, modes of data collection that were available then and equally when we revisited this when we made the change from the active people to the active lives survey face-to-face uh, -face interviewing was prohibitively expensive uh, for us to do that it, we sort of Broadly speaking, thought it was between sort of five and ten times the cost per respondent to do a survey like that, and there's no way we could sustain that kind of uh, investment. So that's been at the heart of, I guess, our more pragmatic approach to it as well. Whilst I think we probably accept um, at times, you know, the response rates one can achieve through face-to-face -face data collection, less so now, but the sampling frames that people were able to use for um, the face-to-face -face data collection versus the um, the telephone design back in the sort of mid uh, noughties. Um, uh, yeah, there were compromises being made there, but there was no way that we could get the scale of data that we wanted to produce the, the, the granularity geographically of estimates that we wanted to if we went down that approach. So uh, we went for the best data collection method we could afford, and we were quite strong in other aspects of the survey design. So again, the having a strong sampling frame and a good probability sampling approach felt an absolute um, central requirement to us. Again, quite expensive, even when you apply it to those cheaper modes of data collection. Uh, but it was, um, yeah, we, we were pragmatic in the choices we made uh, to be able to deliver the objectives of the study as we saw them within the constraints of the budgets we had. 
Great, thank you very much. So before the pandemic, we were already witnessing um, a gradual shift from inter-administered modes, either face-to-face -face or telephone, to online. I mean, the Community Live Survey was the first high-profile survey to use a web to push to web approach rather than face to face. And then of course, the switch from telephone to push to web for the active live survey, and also the considerable development work being carried out at ONS uh, for a web first approach for the future labor market survey. But on the whole, there was still some hesitancy to move towards online data collection for most high profile government funded surveys. Um, and so thinking back well, I don't think well, I think we'll miss that one. I'll move on. Just dur during lockdown, uh, when most face-to-face -face data collection was suspended, we saw survey commissioners responding in different ways. Andrew, you were lucky you had your online postal method, so you just carried on. Um, but data collection was paused on, on the Health Survey for England, for example. Web telephone follow-ups were carried out among previous respondents to the National Survey for Wales and the Crime Survey. Push to web was used for fresh address samples, but possibly less than what we would ex have expected. Whereas push to telephone was being used on quite a few government funded surveys, such as the Family Resources Survey, National Travel Survey and the English Housing Survey. So again, even when face to face was suspended, for some of these high quality, high profile government funded surveys, they didn't move online. Instead, they opted for the telephone. Um, why? So, Mike, I think because you, know, you were heavily involved in the FRS, maybe you could explain why, why opt for the push to telephone rather than push to online? Uh, I'm not absolutely sure um, of all the um, all the considerations there. One of the things I was going to say is that um, in the question about why we stuck with face to face, um, the experience of having to do it by um, telephone has to some extent confirmed for us that yes, we were absolutely right to stick to face with face to face. Um, so uh, there'll be more in the uh, in publications tomorrow, but the the CERT, the FRS was significantly impacted by having to do things by um, uh, by phone. I think probably it's. Um, it's something where there's uh, perhaps more expertise to um, to translate an interview quickly. But I think if you've got an if you've got an existing face-to-face um, -face survey and an interview des interview design, then you can fairly straightforwardly say, well, we'll just phone somebody up and ask the same questions on the phone instead of standing in front of them or sitting in their living room. Turn, turning something into an online survey takes a um, fairly substantial amount of development. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to say a couple of things about the face-to-face the -face versus other modes and why we stuck, stuck to them. I mean, one is it's um, the long-standing result that uh, you get better response rates face-to-face. Um, and although the, um, you know response rates are not the be all and end all, um, nevertheless they they are an important consideration, not just for the survey quality but for the survey credibility. So that's always been an issue. There's been an issue of sampling frames. Um, so you know, we have um, for many years used the postcode address file as the starting point for our face-to-face -face surveys. There isn't the equivalent for telephones. Um, so random digit dialing does in principle give you some of the same um, the same uh, strengths, but um, has got a lot of problems as well. And if, if you if you look at the history of surveys, the experience they've had in had many years ago in the US of what happens where you run a telephone survey by um, looking at telephone book um and just assuming that people with a telephone in 1940 were a random um subset of the population um you can go very wrong so the sampling frame is really important um and also interview length that i think we um there's always it was always the received wisdom that there was a um a definite cut off to how long you could make an interview um on the telephone um i think that's probably expanded a bit in 
um, in later years. But nevertheless, I don't think anybody would contemplate running a survey um, over the telephone if it's going to take two or three hours to complete. Um, so those are all the reasons why we've tend to stick to face to face. Um, and likely to continue to face to face? Or do, has the pandemic changed? Any thinking around the mode moving forward? Or if anything, just re I think you already said it earlier on, it's confirmed that face to face well, is probably the best method for, for FRS. Well, I think in, in the FRS, um, it's seems to confirm that yes, we, we were right. And um, where there are other surveys where people have um, said, I don't know what actually it's worked quite well on, on the phone or online. You know, we'll we'll stick with that. Um, so, so yeah, I think the experience varies from from one survey to another. But I think that's the um, yeah. that's the whole point of the um, of the new survey data collection collaboration is to try and bring it bring together that evidence from um, that's been gathered um over the last few years and see what we can learn from it collectively I agree thank you if i could just check with the other panel members has anyone's position on the use of online change or telephone changed uh because of what what, they, what happened during the pandemic uh has anyone's opinion changed about maybe the need to move away from face to face at all I think um, I would say from the Scottish perspective, what I would say is that you know, face to face has got an a, a extraordinary cost, especially in extra rural areas. I mean, you know, if I go around England and look at rural areas in England, they feel like urban areas in Scotland. And, you know, we have you know, more sheep than we have people in, in certain parts. And so you need to still do the face to face. And, and I think telephone, I think the, we need to think about, you know, what is the extra cost of doing face to face over telephone? Um, and I think the, the the other thing that's kind of coming out of um, work that we're doing in Scotland and the, the Scottish government announced a resource spending review as well, which is having mm -hmm. creating a, a lot of us to think about carefully how efficiently we deliver services, how efficiently we gather data and things like that. So I think there's a natural progression. We're going to have to think about mixed modes or are thinking about how, how we do it. So when I say that mixed modes and to go back to what I've said earlier as well is that you, you can't get away from that value that you get from face to face, but we, might, we just need to think about it in the mix. Okay. I've got a few things to say as well, Joe. Yeah, sure. um, so I think uh, baked into the question, there's an assumption that uh, face to face is default in some way. And I don't think it is, you know, it's, all, it's all project specific stuff. Um, and yeah, there's the, there's the cost element. I mean, even if face to face is good value, we are still operating with fixed funding envelopes, right? So if you know, if you if you it's a zero sum game. If you spend a lot on face to face in one one project, then another project's going to be sort of constrained for some, you know, to correspond to correspond with that. Um, but yeah, we we don't just you know, uh, commissioners, I believe, um, don't don't naturally gravitate towards face to face uh, unless there's a very strong case for it and um, I don't know if you're sort of aware of what happens within departments when commissioning research and surveys but essentially we have to um, be very clear about what an evidence requirement is in relation to a particular policy requirement and and go through various iterations of scoping um, a you know a tender document that eventually gets comes to the market and we say this is what we think uh, we need in terms of sample sizes and mode, etc. And you know, there have been either a, run, a lot of um, qualified people um, feeding into that decision, which which mode is most cost effective, or will be advised to ask the market which uh, which mode is is best suited to what we're trying to achieve. And um, so, I, th I think when we do choose face to face, it's not something that's done done lightly and there's normally uh, good good reasons for it and and you know would we be even having this debate if if you know if we didn't have have the the, the pandemic and the problems with um field forces recruitment etc et I, I think we probably might just because the world's moved on with the technology it was sort of accelerated by the pandemic but people just now are very much used to um you know talking to faces in boxes on screens um 
and indeed that may be the preference of some people as well so that sort of um, you know people may now prefer to uh, to do, have remote modes um rather than have people in their living rooms and and that sort of thing so so i think that will that will play out as, as well but yeah there are just some types of data collection for some types of studies that that require face to face and i think that's always going to be the case to a degree just one final last point i'm um, the way i'm hogging the mic there's just something about conventional data collection means that is well sort of aligned to uh, the social science, uh, sort of the social science type work and the more robust work. Some things can be, you know, we need a certain standard of evidence and that's fine. And other things where policy, you know, well, billions of pounds worth of policy decision might be based on it. You need the highest standard of evidence. And so, you know, people will be prepared to pay for um, the best types of data collection. Okay, great. Thank you. Andrew, you've got your hand up. Thanks, Jay. I just want to yeah. really build on the point that Michael was just making. I think um, um, I think choice about mode should be based on, as, as others have said, you know, the, the context and the requirements of the particular study. Uh, but um, and I also think the pandemic probably has accelerated a few things that we're observing before. But it, it does feel to me like um, some of the more traditional um, modes of data collection have been uh, increasingly finding it challenging to retain the response rates they perhaps historically have um, and that's been a challenge for them and I think one of my observations of, of having worked with a push to web survey now for quite a few years is it still feels like it's a methodology that we are improving and refining year on year as we learn how to do it better and the, and the natural kind of default of the population as people says they are increasingly connected and digital and more comfortable giving information uh, through these methods. So I don't think it's necessarily the right answer in all um, instances, but it's it feels like a methodology that's sort of on the up, as it were, rather than one that perhaps is being threatened by uh, perhaps changing patterns of behaviour, uh, lifestyles, the use of technology in, in households. So it's, um, yeah, just a, just an observation. Great, thank you. I am going to, because we are running a bit out of time, so I'm going to push forward a little bit, because of course, in addition to shifts in mode, um, we've also seen an increasing interest in the use of, of, of new technologies, or maybe not so new, but new for survey research at least, such as mobile device data and meters that can be placed with respondents. Um, we're seeing a lot of this work, a lot of the work in this area being carried out uh, for academic surveys, including the work carried out at the Centre for Longitudinal Studies and ISA. But the use of new technologies and government funded surveys is still quite limited. Um, and given that, you know, the, the, that they use new technologies as the potential of reducing respondent burden and potentially improving accuracy, what do you think are the barriers to using new technologies in your surveys and how can survey suppliers help you? Who wants to go first? I'll open. Maybe I, I can uh, um, jump in, given that we are looking at some of these issues uh, um, in our living cost and food survey. Um, so I, I mentioned earlier we got this diary. It's always been on paper with the pandemic. We had to quickly um, make it in a slightly different mode. So at the moment we are getting people to basically take pictures of receipts and send them to us. Um, and basically, there has been a project carried out for a number of years in collaboration with other European countries, in particular Statistics Netherlands, to look at the development of app and app essentially to try to track expenditure. Um, I think something in terms of government service that we have a bit of a barrier, or you know, can be seen as a barrier or uh, is a useful framework to work in is clearly there are some guidelines in terms of government digital services that we need to ad adhere to and accessibility and that does create some additional work maybe as compared to being a private survey provider uh, and you can just go on <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, and try some new technology um i think there is a lot of potential um so on uh, on expenditure in particular, uh, clearly people do a lot of purchases online. Um, you know, I, I myself only use my Google Pay to pay anything at the top of the phone. So there is really a lot of potential there to explore how you go about linking the sort of information back uh, into the survey. I don't think 
the new technology can completely substitute the survey because as Adam have mentioned in terms of the limitation of the admin data, you still don't get the rich social demographic that really is what people want uh, out of our survey data. But there is definitely a lot uh, that we could explore and it could really help to um, improve respondent burden as well. Um, plus, uh, there is some evidence, uh, as you know, Jerry, that uh, the younger generation that be my keener to uh, you know cooperate into this service which is always a demographic we struggle a little bit uh, to capture okay great thank you any other thoughts on that and also maybe thoughts on what survey providers could be doing or academic researchers to help you make these use of these uh, technologies well, it's just um a few maybe slightly random thoughts in this Jerry. I mean, one is that um Clearly, you have to have a need for data which um, which can be collected through uh, through new technologies, and there are some things which it's appropriate for. I mean, Martina was talking about detailed expenditure data. Um, others that um, that have been used quite often are around uh, activity monitoring. I think there's the sort of pitfalls um, you need to understand. Firstly, the um, the accessibility issues. Um, you know, who is actually um, able and willing to use various uh, devices to collect data. Um, sometimes there are, there are issues around selection bias. So um, there have been surveys I've seen done in the past, which are essentially limited um, only to people who happen to possess an iPhone, um, which gives you lots of nice, interesting data and a huge big data set you can do exciting things with. Um, but is by no means um, robust survey data. And you also need to think of the, the, um, the accuracy of the data. And there's a potentially um, apocryphal story about people trying to collect activity data by issuing um, monitors to people and some people um, fastening their, their Fitbit to the dog's collar um, to make sure they, they recorded more than the uh, the the usual number of steps um, and it goes back almost to the, to carry on films and people putting stirring the thermometer in the cup of tea to give a false reading so you know, the as with admin data the assumption oh this is uh, this is a tip top high tech device so the, the data must be completely accurate um, might not bear close examination in all cases it's a bit of a warning to you, Andrew, if you want to use accelerometers on the active life survey. <laughs> Maybe do cross tabs against people who've got dogs in the house. Um, Michael, you've got your hand up. Yeah, so I think two quick points. I think the first one's the most important. And, and I really do think this is an issue. The, there's, we're talking kind of about uh, potentially future innovations in, in technology health. Yeah. There's been a massive, massive innovation over recent years, and we're all sat talking at screens, looking at each other, having a you know a, a, a virtual meetup. And um, and there's a world in the future where face to face doesn't happen, and this happens instead. Um, and I naively assumed that that was all going to unfold quite quickly after the pandemic, and it didn't. So video interviews mm -hmm. didn't fill the gap, if 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 you like, uh, and. Um, you know, for very good reasons, it turns out. Um, well, there's some some very good reasons, some not so not so good reasons. Um, and I and I just think, you know, whoever gets there first amongst you, you, you know, your agencies uh, and and starts to make that happen and work at scale uh, with good data quality, reduce costs, etc., or comparatively reduce costs, then I think that's going to be a really big advantage. Um, yes, some of the reasons were. We can only um, video interview people if, if they've got teams. So talking about teenagers with MS teams on their phone and um, because it was GDPR compliant or something like that. Um, and yeah, I think another one was we can't, yeah, we can't provide I something to do with wiping down phones or something like that or, uh, during the pandemic or something like that. But yeah, so that could, it seems to me that could be sorted out perhaps among, um, we can all, uh, We'll see how it unfolds. And then the, the other one is apps. Uh, so we ran an, sort of an experiment in children of the 2020s, I'll say the, the early years cohort study, where we asked participants to uh, do face to face um, data collection, but also download an app and take part in activities um, like uh, 
logging their children's milestones and observations about their children, how their parents are feeling, that sort of thing. And I was prepared to write it up as an experiment that hadn't worked and the department shouldn't do that sort of thing again in that context. It was quite successful. So we've got a CISPI representative subset of our early years cohort who are actively using the app. Um, and we're getting a lot of uh, very rich data in, 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 uh, in much more sort of frequent instalments than the, than the typical sort of annual periods. Um, and yeah, so apps can work um, mm -hmm. and might, might be of interest uh, to Colin. Great, thank you. Andrew. Just wanted to pick up again on, on, on the video interview um, point. Um, I mean, just because, yeah, we have the technology to do something doesn't mean people will do it, I think is, is probably the, yes. the lesson there. And there's a parallel perhaps to something that we've initially tried with the Active Live Survey and have gone back to and, and has actually been more successful the second time, which was uh, QR codes for people mm -hmm. to access the, um, the landing page for our online survey. Really didn't work very well in 2015, 16 when we first tried it. Uh, the uptake and much more expansive use of QR codes through the pandemic. Uh, we gave it another go as we came out of the pandemic and, and back into sort of uh, normality and it's worked much better. Um, and I think it is now having a, a positive impact on on the uh, response rates we're achieving through the study. So I think there are some things we just need to keep an eye on and actually understand uh, not just when the technology is ready, but when people are ready to use the technology as well. So I think that's an important consideration. And then, yeah, uh, the the accelerometer example um, of, of strapping it to the dog is is a is is an interesting one. Um, I think we'll probably also need to be kind of cognizant that there will be a few people that tell a few porky pies on any questionnaire we will ever send them as well. So yeah. the idea that um, you know you can have complete faith in all the data from any mode of collection is probably uh, you know we have to be strict about val validate data. But there are some other things that we're grappling with around accelerometers as well and how we might use them. Uh, they can tell us something uh, really quite objective around the intensity of people's activity and the duration of it, perhaps in a way that people can't self-report. But it it leaves gaps in other areas in our sort of understanding. So we don't know necessarily what the person is doing other than they are expending a certain amount of energy. Uh, we perhaps know less about how they feel about that activity, which are incredibly important bits of information if we're going to make sensible policy responses to some of these things. So um, I think for us, accelerometers and technology have a place, but we need to figure out where it is. And I don't think it's necessarily at this stage to wholesale replace our self-reporting data. It's how it sits alongside it and complements and strengthens it. Great. OK, thank you. Ali, you've got your hand up too. I just wanted to come back on your question, uh, Jerry, about what can survey uh, suppliers do to help with new technologies? And I think, I don't think in, uh, quite often people will say, oh, government's risk averse. I don't think we are risk averse at all. There are just a number of hoops that we have to go through before we can go and spend money. Um, and so when we're, we're spending money on surveys, we need to justify why, why we think this is the best way of doing things. So I think the, the, the job that service suppliers can do to help is, if you're suggesting, suggest a way, different ways of doing things, but what, and, and the, the guys in, the, certainly the guys in the Scottish Government, I know how busy they are and they don't have time to do this. Um, maybe you don't have the time to do it, but if you're wanting to embrace new technologies, bring with us the evidence of why that will deliver either a better outcome or a more efficient outcome or something that will will deliver a, an, another benefit that we maybe haven't thought about. So that that's the thing I think is that not just bringing together the new technology, but why that will work as well, and that will help whoever it is that's trying to procure the survey um, to think about the case that they're building when they have to go and get the tenth sign off that month to to get that through. Great, thank you. And I've got quite a few survey providers uh, listening at the moment, so hopefully they're hearing you. Um, OK, great. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to move on a little bit more quickly now. Um, 
we're starting to notice an increasing interest in, in reducing the gar carbon footprint of surveys. Uh, for example, the Welsh Government specified that this should be a key requirement for the recent redesign of the National Survey for Wales. And Andrew, you wanted us to cover this at this meeting as well. So it's obviously something that Sport England is interested in. Um, so perhaps, Andrew, you could tell us how important is carbon reduction uh, when you're thinking about the design of your surveys? For example, you could drop your paper questionnaires on Active Life Survey, um, but that would increase the bias. Um, to what extent is that an acceptable trade-off? How do you make that decision? How does it weigh up? Thanks, Jerry. I mean, I guess probably the, at the outset for me to say is I think it's a question that we are grappling with rather than we feel we've resolved. Um, we've recently launched uh, a new strategy, and I guess probably in common with uh, pretty much every other public agency that will be doing that, thinking about the sustainability of our our strategy, our organisation, how we interrelate with other organisations, everything we do um, needs to consider this. Um, and I've just been struck by other sessions I've been in in the last few months about other uh, commissioners of surveys thinking about um, how they deploy uh, uh, fieldwork interviewers to try and reduce the number of miles they're doing to, to get around to interviews. For us, it's about essentially the kind of volume of paper and postage that goes on through the survey. Um, and yeah, if we can if we can reduce that, it feels there's a you know there's an absolute um, imperative for us to do that. It's the responsible and right thing to do. I think the thing that's coupled with that for us as an organisation is um, is uh, and I'm sure we're not unique in this, but the inflationary pressures on some of these costs as well. So it's it's potentially good for the um, the sort of business model of the survey as well as for the environment to reduce the amount of paper that it produces, uh, to reduce the amount of postage and mailing that goes on through through a study. So it's so it's something we're we're actively uh, thinking about. Um, we haven't resolved it. I think if any of the other panelists or anyone on the call has uh, some brilliant ideas on it, I would love to hear them. Thank you, Ali. Your hand up, yeah. Yeah, thanks. I think I think it, I mean absolutely. We should all, you know, in our day to day lives, we should always be trying to look at you know reducing our carbon footprint in all areas of our life. But you know, there's nothing going to reduce carbon output from the UK like turning off a coal power station. You know, those are those are the big things that we need to do. And I think transport is not as big. And this is go back to my agricultural days. That transport is not as big. Uh, a carbon uh, emitter as other parts of supply chains. And um, I would just point to, I think it was in the BBC last week about plastic in food. And actually, you know, stopping plastic has unintended consequences like food spoils quickly, you get methane emissions. So what I'm trying to say is that in all of these things, there are always trade-offs. Um, and I think that the, 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 they're not well enough understood. I think one of the things that we, we, we would want to do through the surveys, though, is think about how do we design better policies that, that lead to systemic reductions in carbon uh, emissions for, from society. So I'm, I'm not particularly concerned, I, I, although when I say not particularly, I would like to think that everybody is trying to reduce their carbon footprint. But I think the scale of what we're trying to achieve through the data that we get is more important. So, but there are just there are trade-offs there, and we should absolutely try to reduce our, our carbon footprint at every every step. Thank you. Okay, all right, thank you. Can I just check with the other panel members? Is this something that's um, featuring um, in your departments as well? Um, I can say. Quite simply, no, not as far as I'm aware. We've not not really thought about this. And it's um, there is a there is an overall question. Obviously, the um, the carbon footprint of a face to face survey compared to an online survey um, is very much greater. But um, that I can't see that as being likely, other than in very marginal cases, to be a reason to um to take to go down the online route if we genuinely thought that face-to-face uh, -face surveying was necessary i think this question that um chris martin's raised in the chat is an interesting one you know how you actually organize your interviewing 
and it's um it, it relates very much to a case i saw um, some years ago where there was an alternative survey design proposed which used smaller um primary sampling units for a face-to-face -face survey which brought about a um a significant cost saving but in fact the effective sample size was um reduced to the extent that the the cost per effective survey response actually went up um so you might you might actually find that uh, it's not as easy as you might hope to reduce carbon um costs of uh, an interview survey so i'd be really interested in um in any strategies that uh field work agencies um had thought about tested um to uh, to bring about reductions but also how to measure that carbon footprint reduction sounds like it could be more complicated than we think um michael you... yeah i was just gonna say i mean i i, I didn't think we're doing a great deal on this in dfe to be frank um part of this you might be around the evidence as to which uh, modes uh, and which scales of research are more or less environmentally friendly and um, so it, it kind of feels like there should be some cross-cutting work either across across government or across agencies um where we have a ready reckoner that helps us try and understand what the the environmental impact of our proposed research model would have uh, compared to alternatives um, because yeah obviously it's, it's a critical thing to want to address and um, we have really yeah, we have really recommends for costing research based on past contracts and invoices and that sort of thing it would be nice to have a similar thing that would at least give us ballpark estimates as to how damaging our or not um our methods are because uh, yeah i think there's a point made in the margins about uh, does running something online on on servers across the other side of the world uh, is that better than having you know three pages of a4 go out by the post it's, it's just uh, and, and what what's the tipping point where one becomes better than the other it's quite complicated yeah i mean there's a risk here that just becomes a, a box ticking exercise isn't it um this carbon reduction thing and i think we should be wary of that and try and find better ways of measuring it um, before I move on to the last question that I have, uh, can I just check if anyone else has anything else to say about the carbon footprint? I mean, I've seen quite a few comments coming up in the chat. I can't absorb them, though, because I'm going to be focusing on what you're saying, but I'm sure we're going to pick this up in the discussion again. But uh, anything else? In which case? In 30 seconds or less for each of you to answer, what is the main thing? that survey suppliers, researchers, methodologists can do to help you make better informed decisions about the commissioning and design of surveys. Who wants to go first? Do you need a bit of thinking time? <laughs> I, I can do the cop out answer to buy everyone else some time to, ha to have a think, <laughs> which is maybe it's for us to involve um, the market and suppliers earlier and, and have more uh, open tenders to allow the expertise from the market to, to shape what we're doing rather than uh, coming to the market with a highly specified project and um, which we think we've thought through well perhaps you know perhaps it's better to have people on board we we do do that to a degree with market warming exercise and that sort of thing for sort of pre-tender exercises but um yeah perhaps a more collaborative ap approach to commissioning particularly in the current context where you know, we're asking for the moon on a stick in a very difficult industry conditions. Um, you know, perhaps that would be a, a, a some sort of forum along those lines of defense. I like collaboration. That sounds good. Um, who wants to go next? Well, I'll use the collaboration word word as well, which is to um, to work with the um, survey data collection collaboration, because what what we really need, I think, is um, is authoritative, um, readily accessible and readily understandable information on the pros and cons of different survey approaches, um, partly so that we can think of them ourselves and partly so that when we try and justify our choices to others, um, we've got the ammunition to hand and uh, a lot of that 
wisdom will come from the uh, field work agency. So getting that across is um, is going to be huge. Okay, thank you. I was going. I mean, the collaboration one is absolutely key. I'll, I'll, I'll try and do an extension of that. Um, tell us what you think we should be doing as well, mate. You know, as part of the collaboration, tell us where we think the, the efficiencies come can come from. And I think, um, yeah, I think the, the other the other thing as well, I would I would say is that we're, we're we're moving into a world where you know we have to be much more efficient. I think we've all spoken a little bit about that efficient either in our our, our our carbon the footprint or 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 the the amount of money that we can spend or the the way in which we get we get response rates so let's let's not I, I, what I'm, I'm encouraging in scotland is for us to not think about just you know carrying on as is think about how can we get smarter so work with us on that as okay. well please great andrew yeah, in, in a similar vein, I think um, some of the things I've valued most about working with um, uh, suppliers over the years is when they've been able to share their learning from other studies. I mean, certainly we we wouldn't have gone down the push to web route so quickly if we hadn't been uh, sort of made aware of some of the work that was going on elsewhere in government. And that was a very good move for us. And some of the things we've done uh, with suppliers uh, over the course of contracts to uh, innovate, develop, improve over the life of those studies as well has been really, really valuable to us. So um, yeah, again, forms of collaboration, but sharing learning best practice. So so we can uh, yeah, ask better questions, let better briefs basically, yeah. Great, thank you. Martina, last but yeah, not least. <laughs> I, I struggle a little bit with this one because I can see both sides of the question here. But I, I think, you know, reiterating really what others have said, I, I think that collaboration is quite key. And it needs to be a genuine collaboration. But actually, I, th I think the Commission certainly need to trust uh, the field work agency, that they don't have secret agenda to try to squeeze more money out of it. There are certain things that they've learned from other studies that work uh, and some they don't. Uh, um, and, and being able to share that sort of research and being a little bit authoritative in terms of, look, this is really not going to work for you, you need to come back and, and think about it. I think we just need to understand each other's position a little bit better. Um, I do find sometimes as well there is um, there is not a full understanding of actually what you can get out of people when you go out interviewing them. Um, and we just need to be a little bit more considerate of both sides of the house. Great, thank you. So the title Jerry, for the if next... I oh, be, sorry. Yeah. If I could be as cheeky as to ask a question back, which is what do service suppliers think we should be doing better. What, what what else do they need from us as well? I, I, if people want to put things in the chat, it would be great to see. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. So that's a question. So for, first of all, I was just going to say, so the, the title for our next um, meeting was going to be collaboration, 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 collaboration. We had five times collaboration there. Uh, which is one thing I want to pick up with that Andrew said. It was not just collaboration between um, uh, the commissioners and the suppliers, but you also mentioned, Andrew, that you learned a lot from other government departments as well. And I was just wondering, because that's a bit of a mystery to me at some times, to what extent is there collaboration happening, knowledge sharing happening among uh, the different departments? Yeah, I mean, they're going. You sorry. go, Michael. Sorry. No, and, Andrew, sorry, uh, the question was for you. So, um, if oh, no, for anyone. Yeah, no, and, Andrew, please go first, and I'll uh, I'll chip in afterwards. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, I mean, groups do exist. Uh, I think they have probably been, uh, you know, more active and less active over periods of time, depending on other priorities and pressures of individuals that have been central to those. Um, I mean, the particular. Um, uh, example I was giving Jerry was actually um, interesting. It was a supplier telling us about what work they were doing with another one of their government clients. Um, so it wasn't, it didn't come through a formal government network. But I think we want all of the sort of um, eyes and ears and arms reaching into all of these things because, uh, yeah, no network individually is going to be complete. It's how you connect into a series of networks that is probably going to give you the most. Uh, useful and, and kind of um, complete picture of something that, that from yeah, my perspective. But. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Because if, uh, this is part of the answer to Ali's question. Then for me, as, 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 as one of the suppliers, it'd be a lot easier to have a network of government 
survey commissioners to talk to rather than individuals and then having a bit more of a joined up picture happening then and then a proper sharing of knowledge. But I think I'm going to have to draw this to an end because we have gone over time a little bit and I want to give the audience a chance to ask you questions as well, as well as answer Ali's question. Um, uh, so I've got given the very difficult job to Olga. She's been keeping an eye on the chat. Uh, there's lots of questions. I'm going to have to try and capture those before before we close the meeting later so that we can respond to that. But Olga, have you had any any luck in trying to collate and pull questions together? Well, I was looking, I was watching the chat and it was an amazing discussion going on. So to be honest, I think there were only a few questions which then were responded by the, the people from the audience. So I'm not quite sure. Well, but what I noticed, obviously, there were various examples from various surveys about mode switching and different experiments and things like that. Then discussion about barriers, what were barriers to transitioning, for example, to online data collection. And I noticed things like biomeasures were mentioned, length of the questionnaire. And then also interviewer, so uh, <laughs> interviewer roles changing and the uh, uh, availability of the workforce of the interviewers after the post pandemic. Um, also, what I was really, really excited to hear uh, the collaboration, as Jerry said, you said, it was mentioned five times. And I will mention at the end, obviously, there is a plan, and I'm really hoping that this plan. Uh, we'll be going ahead very, very soon. So I'll mention at the very end of this meeting. And I think we will definitely take forward many of the ideas which were discussed today. So uh, going back to the chat, Jerry, when I was looking at it, I think that maybe the best idea is if there were some questions which were not addressed yet, maybe if we open the floor to the individuals and then they ask them, because literally there were not that many questions. There were more comments and suggestions and ideas. So I think the best way is just to open the floor. The Sounds like a good idea to me. So um, if I could just ask the people who are in the audience, um, if any of you have got an answer to Ali's question in the first instance, uh, could you raise your hands? I don't know, Ali, if you want to repeat your question. It would just, what would survey suppliers say to us? What could we do better? What could we? I see more time. Somebody said more time to allow uh, R&D uh, and tenders. Um, and, and yeah, unfortunately, I think I think we're probably um, hamstrung by procurement rules there a lot of the time. But I don't know if there's something. Oh, Ali's frozen for me, or is it me that's frozen? Oh, oh, you're back, Ali. You froze for a second there. That question came from one. Well, my, that point came from me, as you probably guessed, Jerry. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think you just reflecting upon. So I do a lot of work across government, and um, but then also, you know, do speak to the suppliers as well through that work. And a lot of the time, they would like to be doing more thorough R and D, but the tenders don't allow them to do that. So I think really that change needs to come from within, and we need to allow those suppliers to be able to do design and if they want to advise and you know, be in that collaborative space, actually we need to allow the time in our timelines to enable them to, you know, be able to advise and to say we need to do more R&D as well. So I think just to really improve the quality of what we're getting at the end of the day. I see someone's hand up. Oh, uh, Fiona Johnson. Thank you, Jerry. My name's um, Fiona Johnson. I work at the Competition and Markets Authority and I had a question for the panel about push to telephone um, methodology. I, I'm familiar with push to web. Our recent experience of a telephone survey was not great. We wanted random digit dialed <laughs> random probability sample. Mm -hmm. um, the, a, the agency proposed something that wouldn't have been anything like that because they were, they were going to top up the RDD with uh, panel leads. They used it, they implied it was a top up, but actually it would have essentially been a panel survey using the telephone numbers that panelists have provided. When we pushed back and said, no, we definitely only want RDD, we found response rates were terrible. It was really hard for the interviewers to persuade people to take part. Our response rate was terrible our achieved sample size well no our response rate wasn't too bad but our achieved sample size was nothing like what we needed so I, my long-winded question is how well push to telephone actually works because if if we believe the, the agencies people don't want to use the phone to talk to uh, researchers anymore mm -hmm. okay um 
I'll check in with yes, Mike. Yeah, I might have slightly misunderstood the question, but I, th I think that um, there are different problems with different ways of doing telephone surveys. I was uh, reviewing some of the surveys that we've been involved in um, about a couple of years ago now. And one of the clear difficulties is that most of the numbers that people use are mobile telephone numbers. And an awful lot of people will not answer a call which comes from an unknown number. Um, so random digit dialing, I would imagine, is hugely difficult. Whereas something which where there is some possibility of um, of an initial contact saying, please call this number or we or this number will call you uh, I think would not necessarily suffer from the same problems so I, I it's some it's a point I, I thought of making um, earlier that uh, things can go um, in both directions that at one point telephone surveys looked like the future and then with people so many people moving to mobile phones suddenly they don't look so clever anymore um, there was a time when postal surveys were almost impossible because people were inundated with junk mail coming through their letterbox. Um, now they don't get that. What they get is they get spam email in, instead, and a, a letter through your letterbox is a rare event to be celebrated. Um, so you, you you have to think about the the context in which people are contacted. But I, I would imagine that push to telephone could be effective if you think carefully about how you make sure that people's initial contact is one that they will trust. I don't think it's about we don't want to talk on the phone. It's about I do not want to answer the phone to somebody um, who I do not know who is probably going to try and scam me. Martina, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to say, oh, and that's clearly moved uh, all its surveys on the telephone during the pandemic. And um, they, they actually, we were expecting a drop in response rates, which we, we observed, but it wasn't as bad as we were fearing. Uh, and it goes back to what Mike said, it was the mode of contact. We didn't do, you know, random digit dialing. It was literally a letter where we were asking households to get in touch with us. Uh, it's got issues in terms of bias. Uh, we did get a, quite a different uh, profile of respondents. Uh, but um, the, there is something in there for the telephone is, um, you know, going back to something you asked before, Jerry, in terms of some of the changes that we are carrying on, we are going back face to face. Uh, uh, that is mainly driven by the fact that our surveys are just too long for the telephone. Um, we got to 60 minutes on the telephone, it's still slightly too long. But it's interesting because, for example, we're being a little bit more flexible in terms of where people are busy and they can't really meet uh, an interviewer face to face. Pre-pandemic, we wouldn't really allow that interview to happen over the telephone. These days we got a little bit more flexibility because some of the concerns around the quality, they're not as high anymore. The main concern at the moment in terms of mode is how much we can squeeze uh, through um, and being able to reach people. Great, thank you. And Andrew, if I remember correctly, one of the reasons that the Active People Survey when it changed to Active Lives moved from telephone, which was random digit dialing and went to push to web was because the random digit dialing method was not delivering how it initially delivered. Uh, that's right, Joe. I mean, this is obviously uh, nearly 10 years ago now, and I think probably more than that when we started to thinking about making that change. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I mean, the coverage that the RDD sample was achieving was diminishing and the profile of respondents we have was getting ever older and more mature which for something like sport, which is predominantly done by younger people, is problematic as well. Um, then we had the whole complexity of dual sampling frames because of the switch from landline phones to mobile phones, uh, the potential to select people twice within your sample. Um, uh, for us, we wanted to achieve that local authority level estimate. How on earth do you know where a mobile phone is going to ring in the country if you just are randomly selecting them, or even if it is going to, for us, ring in England, let alone, uh, you know. So there were a whole range of things which made it difficult for us. Um, but I think it's slightly different perhaps to the sort of push to phone uh, mm -hmm. approach that was perhaps originally in the, in the initial question. But yeah, it's, it was a, there are a range of reasons it, it was right for us to move away from that landline um, design, yeah. yeah. 
Okay. And I think for anyone who's interested in the push to telephone approach, I believe that ONS has produced a, a report, I think it came out last year, which compared the sample profiles um, across a number of its surveys that moved push to telephone. So I'm afraid I don't have the link to hand, but um, but there is information available on that if you if you if you want that. Any other questions from the audience? I think Claire Vardman, she uh, placed a couple of questions and I saw the hand was raised, but then it disappeared. So I'm not quite sure, Claire, if you would like maybe. I think she, I can't. Oh, she no, I can see. I can see. Claire? She's here. Claire? Hi, I'm here. here. Um, I, can't, I can't think what my question was, to be honest. Um, in the discussion, you've answered quite a lot of questions. I know I've been to seminars where ONS have been talking really helpfully about the differential response rates to different modes, which has been incredibly helpful. And the other thing that I put in the sidebar was about when I used to work at the Scottish Executive and we used to have these open days. I can't remember what they were called, but we had, where we had suppliers and academics in and we discussed our upcoming research needs and they would explain their thinking constraints and we would explain our thinking on cost and constraints and our ministers kind of priorities and they weren't they, they were quite difficult not not no not difficult they were um what's the word challenging <laughs> yeah, i don't even know whether <laughs> challenging is the right idea they were they were constructive i think so you know it was it was different people explaining their points of view on the same kind of problem but it was so so incredibly helpful for everybody understanding where we were aiming towards and the constraints within which we were operating and they really were so these were just you know they were these were with potential suppliers they weren't existing suppliers they were all the big companies uh all the big research companies uh agencies um consultants and academics and it was just so so helpful to listen to what their views on the existing evidence and forthcoming policy issues were versus governments and what our priorities were and what our constraints were and what our ministers' priorities were. And I don't know whether we do that anymore. And obviously in the Scottish Executive, way back when, uh, that was a, a pan pan nation thing. Um so you know there's not loads of different de departments in Scotland. I don't know whether there's any you know capacity at all or, or uh, inclination to do that across think, governments. Uh, I, I sort of just noticed that Ali seems to disappear so he might have had another meeting to go to I'm not sure or, or there's technical problems because otherwise I would have asked him to jump in but I do believe that last week um, the Scottish government it might have been the Scottish government or some other group hosted uh, a session and supplies were there as well talking about these kinds of issues and what the long-term impact of the pandemic has been on on um, uh, survey data collection in Scotland. So I think there is, it, it seems to be a lot of appetite for this as as demonstrated by the panel members and this a collaboration and, and um, I think this is probably a good moment. If there are no other questions, I can't see anyone's hand raised. This is probably a good moment to hand over to Olga because of course Olga you're going to say something about what's happening after SDC net because I think that, that there is very definitely a need for more collaboration and sharing of knowledge. Um, Olga. Thank you so much. No, first of all, I really would like to say massive thank you to Jerry for leading and chairing this fantastic discussion and to all panel members. That was really, really interesting. So many interesting points and I'm sure lots of things we will take forward in the what I will <laughs> in the next project, hopefully. Thank you all very, very much. And thank you to the audience because it was really interesting discussion happening in parallel on the chat. And I'm hoping to be able to read through it in detail after after this event. So thank you all very, very much. As Gabby mentioned, obviously this is our final event for SDC Net. However, well, Gabby already mentioned this as well. We 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 have lots of plans and lots of ideas for the next activities. What will happen next? And we are currently in the process of finalizing the large grant, which is called uh, Survey Data Collection Methods Collaboration, and uh, hopefully will be funded by SRC, which involves more than thirty colleagues from sixteen institutions in the UK. Uh, and um, uh, so what we're hoping that this exciting project will start sometime uh, mid April to early, Mar uh, early May and then we will be able to start announcing 
various events and various activities. Uh, but we are waiting for the for, for finalizing the contract with the SRC. So we really hope that all of you will continue contributing and supporting our for forthcoming activities. But um, I guess I, I'm not quite sure I can say more at this stage because we're still waiting to hear final details. But for now, I would really like to say to all network members, to all people who attended our events, who contributed to our events, a huge thank you for all the contributions over the last year and a half. And I really hope to see you all again very, very soon in our for, for coming events. Thank you all very, very much.